This is the first episode of The Damn G Show, where I get to talk to friends of mine, people that are in my world that are not really real estate professionals, but are entrepreneurs, people that I find extremely interesting, that have done things in their life that I think that you would be really interested in hearing about. And so the first person that I get to interview is Bobby Coleslaw, or his real name, Brian Warfield, one half of the Fisticuffs. This guy is just a phenomenal human being. Not only is he one of my really good friends, but he has produced tracks for Miguel, Janae Aiko, he is responsible for like finding these artists and popping them off. And I just think what he does for a living is super cool. But in addition to that, he's super humble and real. And I think that you guys should see that there are people out there who can make it that don't have to be phony baloney. So watch this first episode of The Damn G Show. And I hope you guys love Bobby Coleslaw as much as I do. Damn G. Let's go, baby. <laughs> what up, bro? What's going on, Damn hey, G? man. Okay, first, thank you for being my first guest on the Damn G podcast. I'm honored. So, you know, I, I, I'm lucky because I've got homeboys that do all kinds of cool things. You are, in my opinion, one of the coolest dudes I know. In fact, probably the coolest dude I know. I don't know. I, you know, I always thought that uh, Bobby Canote was cool, but then I found out that nobody likes BMX. But I, I know he's the most famous guy in BMX, but like, they're like, so what? Um, but I'm <laughs> just, I'm just playing. Um, but shout no, out you, to Bobby. shout out to Bobby. <laughs> shout out Bobby. <laughs> shout out. We love you, Bobby. Um, but no, bro. Um, I met you, got over a decade ago, mm -hmm. back in the day when I was trying to be involved in music, mm -hmm. and we we got to know each other on a little project, the Frank White project. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Frank. Shout out Frank. What's up, bro? And you have like since I mean. When I first met you, none of this stuff had come out yet. So mm -hmm. the, my, my people, the ones who are all watching this right now, a lot of them may not know you, but every one of them have heard you. Mm -hmm. They've listened to music that you have produced. They know the artists that you developed and, and helped you know, blow up and do incredible things with. Not only are you 10-time Grammy nominee producer, billions of streams, <laughs> billions of streams it's just i mean that that to me is just mind blowing 10 10 billion 10 billion <laughs> who's counting <laughs> 10 billion streams uh but in addition to that you're one of the most humble uh down to earth real people i know you're also a real estate investor and you've been a partner of mine on on lots of projects and whatnot well, and thank, so thanks to you you know you you opened the gates for me so thank you well i mean i i'm i'm proud of you to see everything that you've done and what you've accomplished but uh family friends who are all joining us today i want you to meet my brother my friend brian warfield also known as bobby kosla what's up bro yes Hello, well man. welcome to the damn g show thank you for having me of course I'm so to be here uh what i'm wanting to do with this is expose people to the world of entertainment mm -hmm. and and you know, lifestyles that kids are trying to aspire to be, right? Because, you know, being a music producer, I'm sure there's thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people out there who are like, I want to produce tracks. I want to be, you know, like a DJ Mustard or a Scott Storch or a Bobby Coleslaw. And that's what I want to do with my life. And it's a tough game. I mean, I saw you grinding. I saw you really, really working hard. I remember back in the day in the first studio to where you guys are now before any of the albums dropped, you know, let's rewind it back so that yeah. the people watching can get an idea of, of who you are and where you're from. Tell us about you. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, of course. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always in the background behind the scenes. So thanks for getting me, uh, you know, out of my, my shell, my <laughs> element to, to be here and, and you know, and, and, and say some things, but, um, but no, as, as far as, yeah, like, you know, where, where I started from, uh, started in elementary school, right? I picked up the trumpet in the fifth grade, right? Uh, in my elementary school, they had the orchestra, you know, pick an instrument. And um, my dad was super big into music, right? So, in fact, he came, he's from Ohio. He came down to L.A. with my uncle, with his brother, who was signed to Motown at the time. So, you know, music was real big in our household. He's always playing jazz and oldies. So uh, when it came to picking an instrument, um, originally I wanted to play, play the drums, but we lived in an apartment, and so he was like, no. You know. <laughs> so living conditions uh, brought you to your yeah. instrument? Yeah, drums, okay. he said no. 
I was like, all right, well then, uh, he was like, well, what about the trumpet? So I was like, okay, you know, I pick up the trumpet. But <laughs> how is that any better on the neighbors? It's actually not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's not. not. But I guess, you know, you're not banging as loud. Okay, okay. But it, I'm sure the neighbors were still <laughs> Yeah. Especially in the beginning when you're like, when you're not as good and you sound like everything I, sounds I like, live Bruh. next door to a kid who got a drum set for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that, like, they are, I mean, I live in a big house and we got lots of space between us mm -hmm. and i feel him yeah, yeah. i feel him playing the drums so i think your dad was onto something yeah, there but okay yeah. so you got the you got the trumpet so i picked up the trumpet in the fifth grade and uh, again you know my dad was super um you know big into music uh, super big um you know he, he he put me in music schools put me in private lessons right so uh, you know just really cultivated my whole music uh, upbringing right so um started in the fifth grade, fast forward to high school. Again, like I said, all my schools were music based. High school, I went to uh, LA High School for the Arts and that's where I met my partner, Mac, right? So I'm one half of Fisticuffs, the production team, and Mac's the other half. And we met in the jazz band uh, in high school. So um, yeah, man, so it started from there and um, fast forward to when I met you. Yeah, you know, I had, I had my own studio doing my thing. But at this point, yeah, like you said, nothing had came out. I was just, you know, doing music for the love of it. Um, the way I was getting by, I never, you know, I'm proud to say I never had a nine to five, right? Not to say that I was, I had a silver spoon, like my dad didn't, you know, he made sure I was cool. But, you know, the way I funded my life was because I had a studio, I was just, you know, I engineered, I recorded rappers, I recorded singers, I charged hourly. And I did that all the way, you know, to pay the bills, to pay the studio, until I was able to get, you know, uh, on my first like signed artist and then uh, kind of took off from there. But, um, but yeah, so when you had met me, yeah, it was, I can honestly say from when I started making beats in high school to when I got my first check in music, it was 10 years. 10 years. So, bro, like delayed gratification at its mm -hmm. finest, right? Because, you know, not a lot of people have the patience to go 10 years without any, any recognition. Maybe they're making money, but they're like, nobody knows me. Like, I, I'm, what what am I doing here? And you know, at what point do I stop and pivot and do something else? Was there ever a moment in that ten years where you felt like, shoot, maybe I gotta like switch directions? Honestly, no. I I, I will say I, I never had a, the plan B. It was never a thought of like you know this isn't working out because again it was like I, I loved what I did. I, I loved making beats. I loved working with people. At this time, this is when you know, um, you know, Miguel. This uh, this is before he was signed, so you know he would come by. We would just record songs, and this was like the MySpace days, right? So we would put songs on our MySpace page. He'd put them on his page. So you know, again, like it was years before anything even came out. But like you know, we're in here creating this amazing music that you know to me, I'm just so proud of. Yeah. So you know, it, even though we're not getting paid, it's just like man, we're in here creating, we're doing some. You know, I I just knew eventually something would happen. But so, um, what was yeah. the first song that you made where you were like? We did something special here. Um, it would, I would say, so yeah, Miguel was like our first artist that you know we that that took off and that we developed. And I would say, like out of that first batch, when we did like Quickie, uh, off that of was his, a great yeah, song off of his first album. And I remember too, because you know the thing where our studio was at, the one that you came to, it was um there was a bunch of other other rooms and other people in there, right? Right. So you know they would always kind of come up and listen and see what we were doing, vice versa. But uh, it was cool because, you know, we would work on things and, like, get feedback in, in real time from people. And I remember, like, this is the stuff we were doing with Miguel. People were just like, man, this is crazy. Like, oh, boy, you know, he's, he, he got it. He's talented. So, um, you know, again, it just I just knew it was a timing thing. But, you know, didn't really look at it. I mean, definitely was broke. And, and uh, you know, every month was wondering, you know, shit, am I going to have the studio this month? Like, you know, I'm, I'm $300 uh, dollars short. And, you know, I got three days until the rent's due. Like, what Dude. am I going to do? And then... Uh, but God, every time, like a session would come in, a rapper would be like, hey, I want to book 10 hours. And there would be my 300 right there. Boom. Okay. Wow. Pay the rent. And just like every, every month it was always right down to the wire. But <laughs> so good, but, dude. You know, like I said, it was just, you know, I, we, you do it for the love. Like, so it was never really a, a, a thing of like, you know, this ain't working out or whatever. It's just, we were making it happen. So, so I'm, I'm going to bring up something we didn't talk about off camera, but, um, you know, I know that you were a part of developing another artist prior to Miguel, you know, being the first mm -hmm. one. One of, I see he's actually one of my favorite artists, and, and I, um, I got to hear some, like, dozens of unreleased tracks. Mm -hmm. Neo. Mm -hmm. So you guys were involved back then, right? So yeah. that was a disappointment because he was kind of, like, in your guys' camp, mm -hmm. and then it got... You know, swiped away. Can mm. you talk on that at all? Is yeah. that is well, that okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll 
tell you, you know, at least from my side. Um, and honestly, that, so I would say my partner, Mac, you know, that's the other half of Fisticuffs. So Neo and Mac, that was more like, you know, they were working together prior to like me coming on board as, as far as Fisticuffs. So when we got together, you know, I, I think at that point, their situation had already like, you know, did what it did. And, um, you know, again, I don't want to speak on Mac and, and them because, you know, I don't know what he wants to have out there. But let's just say, you know, it, it, did, it didn't work out as planned, um, you know, paperwork and things like that. So, um, you know, it, it, but that's the thing, like, there's no bad blood. Like, you know, we're still cool. In fact, you know, we still see him. We still do sessions here and there, yep. you know, so, um, you know, that's the thing. Never burn bridges. Like, you know, no love loss. It didn't work out in that situation. But again, like. Who's to say, you know, we don't work in the future on, on other things? Like, you know, it's all that's, good. that's a really good point. And, you know, I think having the attitude of, look, it didn't work out between us or, you know, our relationship didn't become what we were hoping it was going to become, whatever that is. But I don't want to create any beef. I don't want no drama. I just want to make sure that I have a good relationship with you moving forward. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the heart, right? That's the heart of, of who you are as a human being. And I know that. I'm, I know that just in the you know, decade plus that I've known you. So fast forwarding then from that situation to Miguel, I remember when I first came around you guys, it was funny because you know, I was a wild one. <laughs> we, had some, we had some crazy nights. I think, I think what probably endeared me and you as friends, you were just like, wow, this dude from Canada came here and just... <laughs> what is he doing and who is this guy but yeah, yeah. but no you, you're always cool man like you know it's just that's it. we were all young you know just wild Crazy. turned up you know turned in the studio up till four or five in the morning so i mean you know just doing shit was it was you know it wasn't out of the norm but like i said you were a cool dude you know like so we, we fucked with you you know you were in la we made sure we took care of you you, you sure and did man it was it was a lot of fun and I, you know um <laughs> I remember the day I got locked in your studio and I had to find my way out and I had to like, anyhow, I'm not going to get into it right now, but it was, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy. All my fault, by the way, but, um, uh, leaving that behind Miguel, mm. right? Probably one of my most favorite R and B acts ever. And I think, I don't know how many babies have been produced Listening to Miguel tracks, right? So what was that like? What was that like when you first heard Miguel belt, right? When you when you guys got in the studio with him and he was just like, you put the track on and and homeboy just let it rip. How did that feel? Like, was there a, was there something? Did you get like a download? Was there something in your soul that resonated with you that said, oh, this is this guy's got it? Yeah, I mean, just his tone alone, you know, just the. You know, you can automatically hear when someone has like a, a unique voice, you know, that's the thing. Like you can hear an artist and, you know, they might be talented, they might sing, but, you know, it's like nothing that makes them stand out. Sure. You know, so the thing is with us, when we work with artists and, you know, when we want to really push the button and develop and kind of, you know, back it, it's just like we want to make sure there's something special about that artist. Uh, and, you know, for us, you know, well, me personally, uh, vocal tone, you know, that's that's like a number one, you know, outside of like, you know, the look and the whole, you know, image and artistry and everything like that just if i hear the record am i gonna automatically know like oh this is such and such you know what i mean so yeah so miguel is one of those as soon as you hear you know his his voice is unique you know it's him you know janae is another one that we were with from the ground up you know unique tone like you know it's her so um you know just uh, you know uh, down the line like uh, artists that we really you know yuna is another one so i don't know vocal tone again is like really a unique thing so with miguel um yeah again his you know he had it He's also a really good writer. We like to work with with artists that that can write themselves, you know, because it's it's kind of hard to always have to depend on other writers. Sure. You know? And that's the thing in this business. It's like there's a lot of artists that can really sing, but they are not good writers, you know. Right. So a lot of times these labels will sign artists, and they'll be getting songs from different people, you know. Like, does it make you respect them less when they can't write? Like, you know, for me, if I'm listening to an artist sing, mm -hmm. I never I never used to know that. Mm -hmm these guys weren't writing their own songs, right? Like, that was something that I didn't learn until I became friends with you. Yeah. I always thought that, okay, if this dude or this this uh, lady is on this track, this is their soul, this is their music, like I'm hearing a piece of their, of their spirit. And that's not actually the case all the time. So yeah. um, is there something about, about the fact that somebody can write their own songs that... Mm -hmm. that makes them more special to you or do you think that it's it, it's really independent of each other 
I think at the end of the day, it's entertainment, right? So, yep. I mean, a lot of, like you said, a lot of the people listening, they, they don't know. Like, you know, especially, you know, credits aren't really disclosed like that. So it's like a lot of people, you know, wouldn't know who wrote what. At the end of the day, it's like, you know, you listen to it. Do I like the song? I like the message being portrayed. Cool. Um, but personally, I, I just think that an artist that can write, they're able to just feel the song more. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, it's, they connect to it more because it's mm. their, own, their own words. It's their own story. You know what I mean? Like if I, let's say if, you know, if you're a writer and I'm an artist and you write a song about, you know, whatever, this, this love situation, I'm kind of telling it, you know, third person, right? So I, you know, I'm not, I don't know the, the stories per se that you, or, you know, the perspective that you have writing it. Um, but if I was writing a story about this, a certain girl, I can really connect because I know the girl. These are my words. This is my story. Right. You know so. And it's kind of like, I'm thinking if I'm a comedian, Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, I try to do that for a minute mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't know how to tell somebody else's joke, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like but I know that comedians do that. Yeah, right. They, 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 they have a team of writers mm -hmm. and they help them, you know, create their their sets and, you know, do all that. And so nothing against it. Right. I have nothing against. I think, Like you said, it's mm -hmm. entertainment. We're, we're here to entertain. And at the end of the day, uh, whether you write your music or you write your song or you don't, if you've got the, the capacity to like belt it and get it out, you mm -hmm. know, and people like the way that you sound and good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you like that. You love the fact that Miguel was, a, is a writer and did his own thing. Uh, so, you know, the cre the success for Miguel was insane, right? I, I remember the album release party. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there. Good time. You guys were all excited. I was excited the first time that I ever heard it on the radio. Mm -hmm. When I heard, you know, your, some of your tracks being mm -hmm. played on the radio, I felt like, even though they weren't my tracks and even mm. though that I had nothing to do with it's any of it. The beginning, but like I was there, you know, and I got to see it and I got, you know, I remember Thanksgiving dinner at Max mm. house. You're right. Just like nobody was popping, like nobody was popping. You mm. were still trying to figure out how to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, we were all scrubs, mm -hmm. you know? And so I remember when I heard it on, on the radio for the first time, I was like, my God, like I was just hanging out with these dudes, you know? And like, homeboys on the radio right now this is insane mm -hmm. how did it feel ryan when you heard yeah. your stuff on the radio for the first time it's because i can tell you how i felt i was mm -hmm. proud as f uh, you know i was like mm -hmm. yes but how did you feel well first of all were you in la or were you in arizona i was in la time? when that happened in, okay yeah it's a funny story because so miguel's from la we're from la right you know we grew up listening to these la stations and for some reason we just didn't get that much love in the beginning with LA radio. Whoa. Right? Okay. Everywhere else. They were pumping. Songs were, so yeah. I had cousins in Atlanta. I had cousins in New York. They would be like, yo, they playing quickie right now. So listen, and I'm just like, damn, like I haven't heard it yet. You know what I mean? So, and I remember I went to, I went to Atlanta. I landed at the, or I landed from the airport, got in the, the, the car and boom, quickies on the radio. Right. So I was like, nice. oh shit. Okay. Went, you know, ate, whatever, did our thing, got back in the car. It was on the radio again. So damn. I was like, damn. So it was crazy to be like, you know, getting the love from everyone else. And I'm over in another place and hearing it. And it's like, but when I go back home, it's like, damn, like, you know, I might have caught it like one or two times. And it's just, it was just like, damn, like, so it was kind of sad in a way. It was just like, you know, I didn't get to really hear it, hear it. Like, you know, like I wanted to be able to like, okay, I, I want to turn it off now. I heard it too many times. Like, when he, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's the, that's the goal. I, yeah, you know, for but sure. I, I heard it a couple of times. Um, you want to hear your song so much that you get sick of I it. I wanted to be like, you know, what? okay, enough's enough. Let, yeah. me, let me, let me turn it. And that's yeah. how, you know, you're, you're doing good. But that was the, the first record. And, you know, fast forward, we had other, other songs that, you know, that I got to hear a lot more, but that one song in particular, cause Quickie was like our first actual like uh, radio single, you know, major major single and um yeah i just i did i only heard it a couple times in la so that was kind of, but when i first heard it though I, you know obviously it like was like pride amazing, right you amazing. must have just yeah. been like damn dude we did it we made it and there's mm -hmm. got to be you know at, at some point when you hear that there's this like reflection and you you know maybe it flashed back to all the times that you almost didn't make rent Maybe all the all the like nights of sacrifice, maybe all the, you know, ramen noodles, all the things that you had to go through where you're just sitting there and you're like, I did it. I did this. Really, the first I'll tell you this as a producer, you know, anyone like the first placement is always the hardest. And when I say placement, that means like, you know, like a song on a major release project. Yeah. You know, that was the hardest because, like I said, I, 10 years without getting a check. So it's like you, you, can, you can imagine like. You know, year one, year two, year three, you know, you work with these people. Oh, I got some good ass songs. Like, who wants to buy these songs? Nobody. Okay. Cool. And then finally, like, you know, 
Miguel gets signed, cool, you know, we have songs that are going to be on the album, great, you know, we get our first check, awesome. But it's just, I, m- I remember that feeling was just like, shit, we finally, you know, we're getting paid officially from a major label. Damn, this was, we, we, we finally got it, you know what I mean? And when the, when the song plays on the radio, it's like, are you making money every time it plays on the radio? Are you like, man, that's 25 cents? It's not even 25 cents. It's very, know. very minimal. You okay. know, but I, I, at that point, you're not even thinking about them. You're just like, you know, more so just like the accolade of it. Like, yeah. I'm finally, you know, like, damn, like our songs. In the, I've been listening to the radio my whole life. And now here's something I made on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. So, um, but yeah, you know, but when, now when you think about it, like in, in, you know, financial terms, yeah, like it's streams now, I think it's like point zero 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 three. Three. Like something, yeah. It's like, yeah. You know, so, but. The more people stream it, the more it all adds up. The more, yeah. you know, like, obviously, it's, it's you know, it, it does add up because life is good. So. Life is good, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you, you know, 10 billion streams, life is good. So that's dope. All right. So, you know, Miguel smashed success, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's killing it. I mean, you know, he's still a very prolific artist. And I know he's got projects on the, on the way right now. And, you know, I've, I've been following his career for a long time. I, I absolutely love the dude. Um, then we're going to talk about my crush, Janae, mm-hmm. right? Now, you know, I just say that because she's everybody's crush, right? But, like, um, what was that like, dude? Like, what was that like when you first heard her go? Because she's like an angel. Mm-hmm. You know, Miguel and Janae are different. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miguel's sultry and, like, you know, very seductive. Janae is like, she feels like she dropped yeah, out angelic. of the sky. <laughs> like, she's mm-hmm. like an angel, you know? So. Mm-hmm. So how did that? How did your ear get trained to hear the difference between oh that's baby me- making music and this one's gonna hit somebody's soul? It's 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 a lot of just you know trial and error, just kind of like vibing and seeing like you know it's all our influences, right? So with Miguel, you know, there's certain you know artists that he admires and and you know we kind of implement some of that into it, and you know with Janae, same kind of thing. But um, I feel like as producers, like sonically, you know, I feel like Mac and I's goal was always to make. R&B, something that, you know, like guys could ride to, you know, like, again, a lot of hip hop influence, right? So we, we like hip hop, uh, you know, again, we came from like a music background with jazz and stuff. So like music and chords and all that. But at the end of the day, like, I love hip hop. I love like bass. I, lo- I love, you know, writing to stuff. So it's kind of like, okay, we have this angelic voice. Let's do some like kind of hip hop beats and like some 808s and stuff that's kind of like, you know, kind of like a juxtapose, yeah. you know, situation to where it's like, okay, you have the sweet tone, but this nasty, grimy beat underneath. You know what I mean? So I feel like that was always our our thing, like pretty and grimy. And she rocked it, right? Yeah. She she killed it, and and you know the numbers and all that show it. They prove it. Mm-hmm. You know, looking at that and thinking about your influences, because it it makes me wonder, like who who inspired you, right? Mm-hmm. Like where did you guys get your your inspiration to to do this? Because it's very unique. I mean, mm-hmm. I. I know a fisticuffs beat when I hear a fisticuffs beat, and I know somebody who's knocking a fisticuffs beat when they're trying to knock a fisticuffs beat. You guys are hands down very, very different mm-hmm. from anybody else out there in the in the world of production. Where did you guys get your inspiration from to make music the way you do? You know, just the, the musical background with hip hop and stuff like that. Uh, Any far, producers? That yeah. You so can... personally, well, I would say like certain albums. That's st- so really when I got to high school. That's certain albums really kind of like struck a chord with me because at that in high school is when I started producing. In ninth grade, my dad got me my first keyboards. Uh, well, I'll, I'll backtrack. So I was playing trumpet that whole time. I was always playing jazz, uh, jazz band. The thing is, I was around a lot of great jazz musicians. Like for instance, uh, like Thundercat, who's, who's my cousin. Yep. Right. Him and his brother Ronald. Shout out to them. Like I've you know been around them since elementary school. These guys were that amazing back then. Right. Kamasi Washington, another jazz great right now. Like. I was around these guys from like high school or before. And the thing is that they were always that incredible. I was cool, but you know, I wasn't, I knew I wasn't on the level of them. So I always knew like, and, and again, like I love jazz, but I, hip hop and R&B was more like my thing. Like jazz was, my, my dad had it in the house, so I appreciated it. But I was just like, man, I know I'm not gonna be a professional jazz trumpeter, right? So when I got to ninth grade, my dad, he ended up getting me my first keyboard where I could like start making beats. And when that happened, it kind of, everything kind of switched where it's like, okay, like, you know, I'm making hip hop stuff, like the stuff I listen to, you know. So I started making beats. And then, like I said, in in high school, that's when certain albums, like D'Angelo's Voodoo album was a big influence for me, like The Roots. um, Because again, like they were doing jazz and they were doing hip hop. So like, you know, like albums like that. Um, And as far as producers, like Jay Dilla, um, 
you know, a lot of hip hop producers, like he's he's like a goat to a lot of people, right? His sound is very unique, but again, he makes jazz and, and musicality with hip hop. Um, you know, I love Timberland, uh, Timberland, Pharrell, you know, they're all unique sounds. Goats. All, you know, just stuff that just knocks, you know? So that's, yep. so again, like I feel like just, we always want something that knocks with like a musical element to it. And then because we play, instruments like we also like to incorporate you know uh, live instrumentation in our production because i also feel like live music it doesn't date you know like if you're listening you listen to stuff from you know back in the days you know marvin gay or you know stevie wonder and all the songs from the 60s and all that it's, it's live instrumentation like it still sure. sounds good now you know yeah when you listen to certain things like i don't know yeah i don't know how long trap music's gonna sound good you know with these synthesizers and 808s and it's all processed like you know it's for the moment but you know, I don't know if it's going to be timeless, whereas like a, you know, like I said, like a, a Stevie Wonder record or a Michael Jackson record, it's, you know, it's just, it's timeless. And that's, again, yeah. live instrumentation. Are they so. going to sample synthesized beats, you know, in the future? I'm sure they will. Yeah. yeah I'm sure and everything comes back around. Like it's, it, music is, is a whole cycle. Like, you know, whatever, it, you know, I think like 20, 30 years, everything, you know, it just kind of comes back around. But, um, but, you know, again, instrumentation is important to us. So we like to implement that. And, so, you know, you brought your pops up a lot, and I know um, your, your pops passed. Uh, rest in peace. He's a massive influence to you, Absolutely. right? He, he put you in position, put you in the art school, got you your first trumpet, got you your first keyboard, was the, you know, inspiration. You know, I, we've talked at length about your relationship with your dad. Um, what was that like for you when, when your dad got to see that you made it? It was everything, you know. And honestly, <clears throat> that made it, I'm not going to say easy, but it made it easier for his passing in my eyes because he saw that, you know, I, I made it as a, you know, like I got my first. So before my dad passed, he passed from cancer. Before he passed, I got my first, you know, Grammy nomination. I got my first gold record. I got my, you know, I was able to buy my first like car and all this yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So he's, he's seen it. So, you know, yeah. I just, I feel like as a parent, you know, you just want to make sure, you know, your kids are, are straight. You know, and so he knew I was good, you know. So after he passed, although it was it was sad, it was kind of like I'm, I'm glad he at least got to know that, you know, I was on my way and, and doing it. And, I mean, you know. for sure, dude, any any father just wants to see that other mm. kid, you know, and you made your dad super proud. Mm. And, you know, he's still watching you. He's like yeah, bumping it all up there. He's pulling them strings. You know? He's, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe sending some inspiration down mm. be like, yo, try this. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure, <laughs> right? yeah. Maybe Absolutely. if you hit this, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. you're getting a little inspiration from from good old Keith up there but mm -hmm. you know I um I love that I'm close to my parents and so for me making my mom and dad proud have always has always been like a massive mm -hmm. driver for me to be successful and you know I know with everything that your dad gave you and all the sacrifices and all that 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 was a massive influence you know of course not to say that your mom wasn't a massive influence in your life as well of course she was but you grew up in your yeah. father's house, yeah. right? Yeah. And my so parents were separated, yeah. So, you know, I grew up with my dad. I visit my mom, um, you know, and to this day, every Christmas, New Year's, I go over there and throughout the year. But, yeah, my dad, you know, he's he raised me and, you know, he put me in music and kept my head on straight and, uh, you know, was very strict to a, 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 you know, but in a good way, you know. Like, I feel like that's why I'm, I'm do chilling you, now. <laughs> do you think, you think Pops had a lot to do with the discipline that you've got? Because, I mean, look, this is one thing I noticed about you, and and you know you get a record, you got an album going out. You know your your music's popping. You got song your songs are playing on the radio. You start getting your check, and I think when we're young like that, right, in like late twenties and whatnot, you're like I gotta go blow <laughs> this money. But mm -hmm. you know one thing I always really respected about you was that that's not you, right? You weren't the guy who was like, oh man, I just got a couple hundred grand. Let's go blow it all because it's gonna come, you know, right back. Where I think a lot of people in the industry uh, that are that are doing well don't have longevity in it because they can't keep themselves afloat. They can't keep themselves going, and and then they have to, you know, leave the industry and just work, or they gotta go do something else because. They didn't give themselves enough leeway. What do you? Where do you think your discipline for financial, like just life, came from? Was that was that your dad's influence? A little bit. I mean, you know, like I said, pops, he worked a decent job. You know, we didn't have much. Um, but I think where my frugalness <laughs> comes from is, well, for one, you know, growing up with, with not a lot. You know, we lived in a one bedroom apartment. 
So, um, you know, for 23 years until, we, you know, he finally was able to move. But um, I, I think for me personally, it, it's just I'm in an industry, the music industry. I'm in an industry where it's just it's not a steady gig. You know, mm. like I can have a really good year in the next 10 years. I cannot have any placements. So for me, it was always like I can't appreciate this now because I don't know what the future holds. So let me be smart with this now because I don't know how long this is going to last me. So, you know, and that's why I was really big on uh, in investing in investments because, like, you know, when we got our first publishing check, you know, we got a nice, you know, a nice check, six-figure deal. In that first year, I, I saw, you know, over 100 grand just spent just off of life. Like, not even, you know, I, I, I got my apartment, I got a car. But, you know, it's like, damn, like, okay, I spent six figures and I didn't, I don't really have much to show for it. Like, sure. you know, nothing yeah. crazy, right? So that made me realize, like, okay, well, this stuff comes and it goes just as fast. Yeah, money you know comes, I mean? money goes, yeah. It goes, it goes really fast. So, you know, and again, like, just, you know, I, I just never wanted to struggle. So whenever I did have money that, that came in, you know, like, what can I do to invest this where, you know, again, my, my job right now is not steady. I don't have a steady check that comes every month or, you know. Um, so what can I do to get me something where I'm getting a check every month? And that's when real estate came into play. I mean, and that's, you know, I think uh, something you and I connected on mm -hmm. was the fact that you were starting to acquire real estate and you were getting more and more involved in looking at, hey, I got to make some cash flow. I got to take the money I get from this check or I got this placement or I got this album or whatever's going on. I got to take this six figures and I go got to go put it in a property. And that's when you and I started flipping houses together and you got involved in real estate. So tell me about your investing career. Let's let's open this up because I think, you know, a lot of kids out there or anybody watching this right now, they're like, okay, cool. You know, Bobby Coleslaw, Brian Warfield, whatever, half fisticuffs. He's, you know, prolific, incredible, 10 Grammy nominations, 10 billion streams. He's still investing. He's still watching for his future. He's still putting his money in something. Um, talk about your investing strategy. What have you got? What have you been up to? Well, first, uh, you know, and this is like an important thing I'll say for people, you know, coming up. Because again, like, I feel like just the knowledge is is key, right? They always say that you know, knowledge is key. And for, for me, so I'll give you an example, right? Um, a, f a friend of mine who's a real estate agent. Shout out, you know, uh, Amanda. She hit me one time and she was like, hey, you know, I see you're doing good in music. You're ready to buy a house. And, you know, just like a lot of people, I'm like, OK, well, I'm not a millionaire. You know, I don't have six figures like that, you know, like t to buy a house, you know. You, right. Especially growing up in L.A., you know, you see houses, you know, especially back then, you see something six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. You know, you think you at least need, you know, half or, you know, a good sure. portion of it. I didn't know that you just needed a small percentage for a down payment and so on and so forth. Right. So. She kind of opened my eyes up to it where she was like, okay, well, are you familiar with like FHA, for instance, right? I'm like, no, what is that? She was like, 3.5% is all you need. So I'm looking at it like, okay, well, you know, this, I don't really understand what you're saying, but like, I don't <laughs> want to buy, again, like I was thinking of like future, right? I want m monthly income. So I was like, okay, well, I don't want to buy a house for myself. I'd rather buy like, like some rentals. So let's, you know, what about like a duplex or a triplex or, you know, multi-unit where I can have tenants and have money coming in every month? She was like, cool, let me get you some some numbers. So she sent me a couple of things. So the first property I, I bought was a triplex, right? And it was in South LA. Again, nowhere, it, it was, it's in the hood. So I wouldn't personally live there, but as an investment, it made sense because the property was cheap. At the time, I think this was like 2016, I bought it, it was 487, right? So a little under 500,000. So 3.5% down. So that same prop, so, the thing, it was fully rented out to, and the thing that I love about real estate, the numbers are there. So you don't have to guess, right? You know what your mortgage is going to be. You know what the rent is. You know you know what the insurance is. So we're doing the numbers. We're doing the math. 3.5%. So I think it was like 14 grand or something like that, right? And the tenants were already in there paying, um, you know, paying the rent. So with the mortgage being paid from the rents, I would be netting like about $1,000 after the mortgage is being paid, right? So now I'm looking at it like, okay, you're telling me I got to put down $14,000 and I'm going to make $1,000 every month. A month. And that blew my mind because I'm like, all this time I'm thinking I need six figures and all this money. Right. Like I just needed 14 grand. Like that's, that's what people buy a damn watch yeah. or, you know, a car. Like, like you know, like you'll, you can't even buy a Honda for 14 grand. You know <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying? Like, but so that opened my eyes. And so I did that. And sure enough, like that was my first property. And I was like, that, that you know, so, and then after that, I started talking to you about it and then you brought you opened my horizons up to like Arizona and other other places like that because 
again, I'm in California. I just did FHA. So now that 3.5, you know, there's ways to bring it back. But let's just say at the moment, boom, that's done. So now I'm in California looking at a house that's 600,000. You know, you put in 20% down. That's a big chunk. Now we're talking about 120. It's, it's a lot, right? But in Arizona, I remember the first property that you brought to me, it was 100, it was like $105,000. Yeah, yeah, it's right? a Hadley. Hadley. Yeah. Yep. It's like 100, 510,000. So now, you know, I remember putting, I think it was like I put down 10% or something like that. It was like 10 grand. And then again, I'm, I'm netting every month on the rent. So I'm like, okay, so I'm still able to put down this low down payment for these cheaper homes, but it's still making sense money wise. Yep. You know, so then I started like eating Arizona up, you know, the next house, boom, maybe 300,000. But again, like these are numbers that I could not see in LA. For sure. Even now, like I just bought something, you know, or I'm actually closing on it, we're, you know, we're in the escrow period. And it's a, what, it's, it's about to be a seven bedroom home and it's like 360. Crazy. And this day in 2024, right, you know what I mean? Right. And um, you got a whole other strategy with that. I know you've been, you know, uh, looking at the co living stuff that I've been looking mm -hmm. at with my sister. And I think the cash flows on those things are insane. Mm -hmm. I honestly, I think that's where the real estate market's going, anyways. Mm -hmm. Co living, shared living, it's like we're just going to do what they did in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, what, that's what happens when you don't have enough housing inventory. It's what happens when your population explodes. That's what happens when there's just not enough places for people to live. You start living together in close quarters, and that's where America's going. It's where America's gone. Yeah, we need and we need we're either going to get with it or we're, you know, going to pretend it's not happening, but it's, it's yeah. happening. And yeah. so um, it's good to see now, you know, looking at your cash flow, mm -hmm. is your, does your cash flow pretty much cover all your expenses now? I'm sure, you know, I don't really have a, a lot of things going on. And like I said, you know, money comes in, I spend a lot on investments and stuff like that. So, but I, you know, I'm sure like it's my, my whole goal actually was to have these rental properties fund my dream home. Right. Cause mm. the thing is like, I, you know, again, coming from a place where, you know, I don't have a steady gig. I don't want music to be the only thing where it's like, okay, well, damn, I haven't been, been able to work on anything. This beautiful million dollar home I have now, damn, I'm about to lose it to the bank, you know? But if I can have all these investments in, or all these rentals in place to where now it's covering my home, let's say if I stop working altogether, I at least know my home is I'm good. I don't I'm not going to be homeless. You know what I'm saying? So that was always like my my goal with all these properties. It's so. it's a very steady investment strategy. You've been like very meticulous and like measured with the moves you've made. You haven't like overstepped. You're like, no, this makes sense. No, that doesn't make sense. And it's been. You know, an incredible, uh, you know, thing to watch you be as as calculated and discerning about the investments that you've made because you've done great, right? Looking at all the money that you've made in appreciation and all that, um, of course, I'm sure you've made much more money in music than you have in in real estate. But has real estate done well for you oh, compared absolutely. to your your <clears throat> entertainment career? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, again, with just the appreciation of property right like that same house that i bought in 2016 2017 that triplex where i you know i paid 487 it's now worth like you know 800,000 right so Amazing. that's like over 400k right there the hadley home i bought it for you know 1 105 110 it's now worth like 360 yep right so probably a little bit more but yeah yeah right, yep. yeah exactly so you know like each each property you know it's just hundreds of thousands of dollars in um you know just um uh, what's the word I'm appreciation, for? appreciation. And yeah. cash flow all together exactly so you know and that's the thing too it's like although i don't see it immediately it's not like liquid cash but like you said at the end of the day you know if i decide to sell something it's like i have all these nuggets of um you know just um you it's, know it's like it's little just, bank accounts exactly you just go in and be like oh i'm gonna go i'm mm -hmm. gonna sell this one and, and i'm gonna take care of myself for four years yeah. if i have to and hopefully i, I don't need to you know yeah. the goal is yeah. to keep it but keep again everything. but it's just it's good to know that you know again because if you just have liquid cash you know, you're just spending it and stuff like that. Nothing to show for it. You're kind of like, damn, okay. But um, but yeah, having these things that I'm invested in, it, it's it's good because you know it's just a security. And your music career is still popping. And still, you're yeah. still doing a lot, and you know you're gonna continue to make um, prolific beats, and many, many, many more babies are gonna be mm -hmm. a product of the fisticuffs. If you could, if you could give some advice, you know, uh, to anybody coming up right now in the music business, so a young buck right now who's like looking at you, admiring you, thinking, "Man, I love the way this guy moves. I wanna, I, I, I wanna emulate him. I wanna be like him. I want uh, to be smart with my money." Uh, what would you, what, what advice would you give somebody that's trying to come up right now that that might be just looking at this, or maybe looking at the situation like it's insurmountable? What would you tell them? Yeah, well, for one, you know, it, uh, what I'll say to producers or people in music, 
you know, just just trust your trust your gut, follow your heart. You know, if you if if you like what you're doing, if you believe in it, you know, it, it takes time. Like, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, what if somebody's not good? How do you, how do you tell them they're not good? <laughs> I mean, it's that's right, you know, because you don't ever want to shoot nobody down. I mean, yeah. eventually they'll probably figure it out. Like nobody, you know. Er, Someone will tell them, you know. Okay. <laughs> you know, so they don't. You don't got a hotline or something. Yeah, so I mean, be like, you know, and then and also too now that we have social media, like you know, the comments are, are that's true brutal. Yeah. So the comments will tell you if your shit's trash or not. You know what I mean? Okay. So, um, but you know, that's the thing. If you if you really believe in it, you know, people around you, like yo, you know, it's just like you just got to stick to it. Again, it took me ten years. I'm not to, not to say that it's gonna take everyone ten years, but, um, you know, it's 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 an interesting story. When I the studio. Before the one you met me in, uh, I was in a studio with uh, some other producers, 1500. There are some big uh, producers in, in L.A., um, BJ, Chicago Kid, Fauntleroy, Thundercat. We were all un- in the same studio, you know, together. And the crazy thing is, you know, granted, everybody eventually kind of like, you know, split and did their own thing. All of us, we all made it in our own way. You know, like someone might have took off sooner. This person might have took off. But like we all stuck to it and we all eventually made it. So I say all that to say like it's just, it, you know, you just got to just keep at it. You know, it takes time. Again, there was about five, six different producers in that one building. And all of us are all, we're all successful because we all, no, nobody stopped. Nobody quit. You know what I mean? So, um, wow. so, you know, that's a testament to that. And then, you know, as far as people like investing, like, you know, just have a, have a goal, um, you know, just have a vision, get information, talk to people that have money. You know, that's why I appreciate you and, you know, if your friends. Like, I, I, I soak up information, you know, especially you start making money, then you start learning about taxes and things like that, right? So, you know, taxes is hitting me. So now I'm learning about, like, okay, well, what are these people? Yeah, oh what are, okay, God. what are you guys doing? What, what's your yeah. homies talking about? What, you know, what can we do? And, um, you know, so you just kind of soak up things, you know, learn from people. And, um, you know, and, and, and don't be afraid to take time. Like, because even now, like I said, with all the properties, I have eight properties, but I still live in a duplex that I own. You know, I have a two bedroom duplex that I'm living in. I rent the other side out. Sure, I can go and buy, a, you know, multi million dollar home right now, but then I'm going to be looking at a, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 mortgage. That shit adds up, you know? Again, that's why I want to have all my stuff in place to where it's like, okay, now I'm not even worried about that because it's covered. So, you know, I'm not I'm not rushing it. Like I'd rather get all these properties and live, you know, live live cool. Like I you know, my place is two bedroom, I have a little studio in one, I got my little gym in the back, I got everything I need. So I'm you know, like I'm 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 not tripping. So I say all that to say too, like, you know, don't don't be Social media have people thinking, oh, yeah, I need to buy this. Don't be extra with it. You don't. You you never did that. You you mm. never caved into like the pressure of, oh man, I gotta get it. I gotta get this. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, like a chain, chain stuff, or, or you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, you just never did that, yeah. right? And granted, yeah, like you know, and I have, I make sure I have a nice car and stuff, and you know, like I do have a little watch and stuff. Yeah, you but got a nice rolly on there, yeah. yeah. But you know, <laughs> again, that, it, it, but it, after time, like I didn't. That wasn't the first thing I bought. You know, I bought. I had probably had six houses before I bought my Rolex. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, don't you know? Don't be looking at. Don't don't compare your life to other people's lives. You know, I'll say that. True. That's like a big thing. You know, you go on social media and you see, you know, this guy in the in the whatever car. You know, he got the Lambo, and you know, you might have just got your first little hundred thousand dollar check, and you looking at the Lambo now, like, why? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, don't you know? Just just do your thing. Live comfortably. And um, you know, and and just just have your plan and stick to it. You know, sound advice, brother. How do people get a hold of you, or maybe not get a hold of you? But how do people follow you and and yeah. and uh, uh, you know, make sure that they can keep track of Bobby Coleslaw? Well, there it is, Bobby Coleslaw on Instagram. People always ask me too, like, where does Bobby Coleslaw yeah, come from? Tell us, where's Bobby? Uh, yeah, Coleslaw? The, I know where it comes from, yeah, but yeah. tell tell the people where the Bobby well, the Coleslaw. School. So it started out with my first social media page, like MySpace days, right? So you know, I was late to the party. Everyone had their MySpace page, and you know, and I, I was just like, nah, I'm not into all that. And then finally, like, again, everybody had it. So I was like, you know, okay, like, I'll do it. I'm setting up my, my profile, and it's like, okay, put your picture and put your name. And I'm like, wait, so people can just search me and find me? Like, <laughs> you know, I come from the era where it's like, you know, you can't you just find be found. me. Yeah, you can't just <laughs> search my name. And what do you mean? Like, so I'm just, you know, setting up my profile, and the first name comes to, comes to mind, Bobby Coleslaw. And then I put a picture up of me with, like, a grill on that you couldn't really tell it was me out of so, you know, that was just my thing. I was just like, I'm going to find you. You can't find you me. You can't find me. Yeah. So, but, you know, then it, but then it stuck. And then, like, you know, now, so Instagram, I'm still like Bobby Kosla. Uh I'm not as ambiguous. Like, you know, people know my name is Brian. Yeah. My face is really on there. But, yeah. um, you know, it's just an ode to, the, to, to my old, uh, you know, disguise days. I love it, But uh, Bobby Kosla on Instagram. 
Um, you know, we have Fisticuffs Music Twitter. I will say we're not very active on there, so if we don't respond, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I will be on Instagram. Um, and yeah, just you know, hit me up, send me a DM. We're always looking for for you know things, music. If you're and, an artist, you're an up and coming artist, and you you got the sound, and they got they got the look, they got the sound, they mm. got they belt. How do they how do they send you a track? Just DM me, man. I be I be in my you know I, I be talking to people all day, so. All right. You know, and then also too, if if you are, you know, if you have management or you know whatever, like we are, um, uh, Warner Chapel uh, is our, our, you know, publishers. So if you know if you're going the the correct route, you know, the major route, um, you know, hit up Warner Chapel, ask to you know holler at Fisticuffs, and we'll we'll set it up correctly. And you know what I mean. My dude, I love you, Brian. I love you too, man. You done you done great, man. An honor mm -hmm. to be your friend. Thank you for being my first episode on here, the Damn G Podcast. Uh, Appreciate guys, it. make sure you guys uh, check this out. I'm going to be bringing all of my friends, people that I admire, folks that I think are just cool people that you guys need to meet. Until the next time, we're out. That's it, guys. That's the first episode. And I'm obviously building a new YouTube channel with this. So do me a favor. Like this video. Subscribe to this channel. And if you're watching this from my other channel, go to the Damn G Show channel and subscribe to that one as well. And do me a favor and leave me a comment on who you'd like to see me interview. And share this with a friend because real people can actually do cool things.